The research shows that the successful parents are neither dictatorial and harsh and exacting, nor are they soft and weak. They find the sweet spot in the middle. My question is, how do I find that sweet spot? How do I practice authoritative parenting so that my children will be confident, secure, obedient, and Christ-like? The best way to parent children and to be sure we're not being too tough or too soft on them is with what we call authoritative parenting. Authoritative means there's authority, but authoritative parenting is not just authority. Authoritative parents are considerate of their child's needs. They listen to their children and they have a warm, loving relationship with their child. They themselves are self-controlled. They don't get angry and feel nasty about things and take it out on the kids. They're self-controlled. But they also teach their children to think about things, to reason, and to make decisions. They are firm, they're patient, they're loving, and they're reasonable. What makes positive kids is a parent who can be a benevolent dictator. I know that seems like an oxymoron, you know, it's not impossible, but that is exactly what children need. They need to know that they are absolutely loved no matter what, and that's the soft side of you, and they need to know that you have boundaries you have rules that need to be kept, and you are strong enough to make sure that you keep, uh, that they do those things. And I, I've used for many, many years um, the idea that ask the child one thing to do, and then make sure you follow through. So it's that balance between being what I call having a gentle touch but having strong values. And when kids see that within their parent, in each one of their parents, that will be the child that will become the strongest in terms of the spiritual uh, uh, development, in terms of their spirituality. Both of you have to be strong in values and be able to stick up for what needs to be done, but you need to also be loving and understanding. And when you can get that put together and respect each other, oh, it's amazing what that does. Because permissive parents let their kids do pretty much what they want. They're not thinking about their kid's future. In families where the parents are too permissive, things happen whenever they want to happen. Meals, Schedule? No, nothing like that. Everybody eats whenever they want to eat. And if it's time to go to bed, and Dad says, don't you think it's time to go to bed? Do you know a child in the world that would say yes? Rarely. <laughs> Rarely. And so, child gets to stay up as long as the child wants to. The bottom line, if you're too soft, is that the kids run the place. Your child needs you as a parent, not a buddy, not a friend, a parent. Let's say dad comes home as the strong one. Why haven't you kids mowed the lawn like I asked you to mow the lawn? And you haven't done your homework yet. This is Thursday night. I told you you need to get it done before supper. And what often happens if one comes home to the family and is the strong dictator kind of per parent, the authoritarian parent. The other parent will take the opposite approach. It's like being on a teeter-totter. So you come down a little hard on your kids. Well, your wife will probably come down a little softer. And she said, kids, your daddy loved you very much. You know, just, just smile and I'll, I'll have an extra cookie for you at, at, at dessert time. And so what happens, dad says, enough of this being nice to these kids. They need to learn a little discipline. And he comes down hard again. And to balance the teeter-totter, what happens is the parent moves further away from the fulcrum. 
and one becomes even stronger and the other come, becomes even more gentle and well what's going to happen somebody's going to fall off and bang the teeter-totter goes down and both of you get hurt so if you find yourself on the teeter-totter immediately say how can i help my husband or my wife come closer to the center well we could pray together we could go to a parenting class together. We could share together how we're feeling. We could even talk about how our parents did it and probably get a whole lot of insight in terms of why we're doing it this way. So the idea is respect each other enough that you don't tell the children, that's not right, daddy shouldn't have said that. You know, that's too, too hard. Um, or don't listen to your mother, she's always letting you get by with murder, you know? <laughs> um, no, you should respect each other and lift up the other in the sight of the children. Let them know you're united. Now, I'm sure at this point you're looking at your own parenting saying, boy, I've made some mistakes, and indeed we all have. In my own life, I look at things I've said and done and wish that I could take them back. What should we do when we do make a mistake? One of the core values of the successful Christian parents was that they were willing to apologize to their children. But many wonder, should I apologize to my children? Won't it undermine my authority if I humble myself like this and apologize to them? You know, when we apologize to our children, we can tend to think that, oh, they're not going to respect me or I'm going to lose my authority because they saw I was wrong. But I want to encourage parents, as God has encouraged me, is that any apology, whether it's a fumble, if you apologize, you go a lot higher in the estimation of your children because they are seeing you being humble, apologizing to them, and it will open up the way for them to be able to apologize to you when the spirit starts knocking on their door. No apology can really go wrong if it's from the heart. And we don't have to feel like we're weak because we're going to confess to our children that we have certain character defects and we need to apologize because they already know that. <laughs> we, have we had to apologize to our children? Oh, yeah. Many oh, yeah. a time. They, yeah. already, they already know you and what you're like. So when you go to them and you say, I'm really sorry, it's huge. And children are so forgiving. You don't have to say much. They're willing to forgive. How do I apologize to my children in a way that doesn't undermine my authority? I think just apologize. I think children have much more respect for us when we say, you know what, I was wrong, I made a mistake, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, I love you, and I wish I had never done that. And I think when children hear their parents say that, that strengthens the bond between them. And children have deep respect for parents and adults who can say those things to them. And so I don't think we should be afraid of apologizing to our children. I think we're far more likely to mis make the mistake that we don't apologize to them. And they go away hurt because we have been too proud to say sorry to our children. If we want them to apologize, if we want them to go to God for forgiveness too, we need to be an example of showing what it means to say, I was wrong. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. So let's be examples to our children of what a true apology really looks like. So during the day, if I raised my voice with my children, I would tell them I was sorry. Parents should never be afraid to tell their children when they have wronged, because your children know it when you've been unchristlike. And if you don't tell them, then they get the idea that it's okay to be unchristlike and not tell. Repent. And we want our children to always repent. The ultimate goal in discipling our children is that they become disciples of Jesus. In other words, that they become Christ-like. In fact, 100% of the successful parents in the research who raised the spiritually strong young adults, 100% of them had the character development of their children as their number one most important focus. Now that's astounding. You never find 100% of anything in polls and research. But these parents wanted their children to be like Jesus. How can we accomplish this essential task of parenting, raising our children to be Christ-like? By the age five, uh, conscience is not fully developed, but conscience is in place. And the foundation for character for the rest of our lives is in place by age seven. 
That's not to say there's never any more character development. There is, because character is something we continue developing uh, on this earth and in eternity. Uh, we will continue developing character. Uh, but the foundation for character is in place by age seven. Developing our children's character really starts at babyhood. And the most important thing we want to train in them and develop in them is the understanding of right and wrong, how to obey. It starts very early on. And, you know, oftentimes we tend to let things happen with our little children that seem cute, which in later years we really wouldn't want to have happen. You know, when a little child sticks their tongue out, it can kind of be funny, but at five and six, wouldn't be so funny. At 15 and 16, it really wouldn't be funny. So we want to start to train and mold that character, even when they're very small. Or, you know, you'll see sometimes a little one, maybe two years old or three, running around saying no when the mother asks them to do something. But, you know, really it isn't very funny. What would happen if they were doing that at 10? And now they're in school, or they're doing that when they're 15 and 16, and they do it with attitudes then as they get older. We want to be cultivating in our children when they're very young, molding their characters into young people that are honest and courteous, respectful and loyal, so that as they get older, those will be what they, attributes that they have. At first, you need to tell the child how the other person feels. So let's, let's look at a scenario that happens any number of times in, in a home. Uh, Susanna is building a block tower. And her older brother, John, comes over, takes a swipe at it, and down it goes. And Susanna starts to cry for all she's worth. So how are you going to teach John, who's only a year older than Susanna, and so we're talking here about, you know, kids who are a year and a half and two and a half. How are you going to teach him empathy? Well, at two and a half, he doesn't have as much empathy as you'd like to have him have. <laughs> and so you tell him how Susanna feels. So you say, John, Susanna feels very sad and very angry. You toppled her blocks. And that's the beginning. You do that many, many times. And your child begins to learn how other people feel. Now, by the time John is three or four years old, you can be in asking him, how does Susanna feel when you do that? You must be sure that you show your child very strongly that you disapprove of hurting people and hurting animals. Those are no-nos. We don't hurt people and we don't hurt animals. That's part of learning empathy. And be very helpful to other people yourself. Children will follow your model. They see you helping them. They see you helping somebody else eventually they catch on and they say, oh, and they copy what you are doing. And you will have put into place the foundation for character. I think sometimes you thought about character as being a great huge thing and it seems really hard to develop something that feels so big and vague and massive. But when we break character down into component parts with attributes like perseverance, courage, gentleness, kindness, generosity, thoughtfulness. And we think about what those look like. What do we do or what do we say when we're being kind, when we're being generous, when we're being courageous? Um, and to think about what can my child manage there? Now, when does my child show this attribute? When, do they, when are they courageous? When are they kind? And once we know what we're looking for, the characteristics that we're trying to develop in our children, we can identify it when they're doing those things. And we can say to them, you know, when you gave that toy back to your little brother, you were being so kind. You could have just kept it or made a fuss, but you generously and kindly gave it back to him. And that was really special. I was so touched when I saw you making those good choices. And then our children get feedback on their behavior. 
and they learn to think, oh, I'm a kind person, I'm a generous person, I'm a caring person, I'm a courageous person, I'm a persevering person, and that helps them strengthen those characters in their own lives. They notice them then for themselves. And maybe at the end of each day we can say to them, what characteristic did you work on today? What did you do to show generosity today? What did you do to be kind today? What did you say that was honest today? And to help the children reflect on what they did well and how their characters are growing. And also for yourself, how is your own character growing? What do you need to work on? And maybe we can work on things as a whole family. We can have a generous week or a kind week or... Um, Choose another characteristic and say, we're going to all work on this this week. Let's see what fun things we can do to nurture our humility, to nurture our, our generosity. Let's do something generous together. Let's find a way to share what we have with those who don't have as much. To so make it fun, to make it something the whole family can be involved in. And by identifying characteristics and clarifying them and feeding back to children when they are meeting those that's what helps to develop those characters in the character of our children. Another way to help develop the character of our children is to look at the Bible stories, to look at the different characters and think, what characteristics are they showing? One of the most important things we can do for our little children is to help them to come to know Jesus as their friend for themselves. Start when they're really small. When our children were just babies, we would play them scripture song tapes. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And then they didn't understand what they were listening to, but we realized their minds are like sponges and they will soak up what comes their way. Naturally, we tend to soak up the wrong more readily than the good. And so we just filled our children's minds with good stuff. And the devil didn't have so much room for the bad stuff because their minds had soaked it up. Up. So start off with devotions when they're really small. Help them to connect their little hearts to their Savior. And then as they get older, they will come to know him and they will have a relationship that will take them places that we never could. Another thing that we did, if you remember, and that was family worship. Mm -hmm. If we can set aside a little bit of time every day for reading the Bible together, it will go a long way because our children are like sponges. They just soak all this up and they soak it all up. So it's our job as parents to pump it in and it will come to fruition later on in life. Once they understand how to have a devotion time, how to have a prayer time, then we wanted our children to actually go out and practice it in the community. We wanted them to share their faith. We wanted our children to put into practice what they were learning. So at seven years of age, uh, well, matter of fact, our daughter was our oldest, was six years old, and she wanted to give Bible studies. Now, she didn't even read yet, so I had to teach her how to read, and then I gave her seven texts that she could use to give Bible studies. And then we went knocking on doors and asking anybody she could if they would give, let her give a study to them. People do not tell a seven-year-old no. They let her give a Bible study. So that was a way that she got to share with people. She actually started a youth group, um, Bible study youth group, and she was in her teens. She had a Bible correspondence school that she ran. Our youngest daughter had a babysitting ministry and a um, house cleaning ministry that she did. She'd call up parents and see if she could volunteer some time just to take care of their children so they could do something else or help clean their house. Both of them sold books, Cole Portering, um, and they both worked for a ministry that was a bookstore and just volunteered time. So they had a lot of opportunities to share. So I need to ask myself, how can I serve my own family? Sometimes that means uh, maybe I help with a cleaning when my wife is too busy. Uh, maybe I help uh, make a meal. Uh, maybe with my children, my children have had a long day or a hard day at school, maybe I help them uh, clean their room. You get the idea, but service begins at home. And we should model that as parents so that they can catch uh, the joy of service. But then think about how service goes out to our neighborhood. And as we walk our streets of our neighborhood, as we walk out and about, uh, we should be looking for ways to serve. Sometimes it might mean uh, like I have a, some friends of mine that uh, as they were going up and down their streets, they saw an elderly person who was struggling to take a, a pail of garbage out to the road for the garbage man to come and take away. And she was struggling. She was an older lady and she was uh, not very strong. And uh, 
the parents said to their children, what could, what could we do about this? What do you think Jesus would want us to do? And the children said, let's help her. And the dad and mom said, that's a great idea. So they ran over there to their neighbor lady, and they said, can we help you take this trash out to the road? Oh, she said. Her shoulders just sagged with relief. She said, I would be so grateful if you would help me. And so they helped her. You know that that became something that they did week after week month after month, even for years later, every week, the children, as the children grew up, they went down the street and they asked the neighbor lady, can we take your trash out today? I think tomorrow the trash man is coming. That's just a simple illustration, but it's a reminder that service is not a big program necessarily. It's just a part of our life. It's something we can do all the time. And the last thing we did is outreach. We always wanted to our children to have opportunities to go out in the community and share. We already talked about the spiritual things that they were doing, but we had outreach together too. We went to nursing homes. We even took in rebellious teenagers into our home when our children were small. And then we took in children into our home that needed a home temporary because the parents were going through something. So our children learned how to minister, always in our home too with other children. So that gave us an opportunity to share some of those not just spiritual things, but a different type of bonding with other people. So we had a lot of opportunities for that. Far too often, we neglect the most important things that there are, don't we? Only recently, my wife and I have fully committed to having a study time together each evening where we pray and we seek the Lord's direction and we might ask, how do we find the time for this kind of a thing? We are all so busy. Well, to actually pull this off and accomplish this, my wife and I have decided to get ready for bed and get the children ready for bed way early. Cease all of our work for the day early on in the day so that when it's time for family worship and to put the kids to bed, then right after they go to bed, we are available for our study time. And I can tell you, every single night, that we've had this time with the Lord together. We've received the same impression, the same insight, the same conviction. And that is this. Cammie and Scott, it is your personal connection with Jesus Christ in a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with Him throughout the day that is going to determine your success or failure as parents. Each day, if I'm not walking with the Lord, it will not work. I can have all the greatest parenting strategies ever come up with. I can study and watch videos like this, but if I don't have a living connection through faith in Jesus Christ, then raising my children to know the Lord will not be likely. So the question is, how can we pull this off? We have our morning devotions. We go throughout the day. Do we keep our connection with the Lord and do our children see us walking with the Lord? Now for your children to have a relationship with Jesus, you yourself need to have it first. So we always did pray, we did study, we did have family worship, but we were more intent on it when we moved out into the country. We wanted to make sure it wasn't um, sporadic whenever we decided to have it hit and miss. We decided that it would be every day. And as our children were watching us, they learned how to pray. They watched their father morning and night so that they, they would understand that he always took them before the Lord. So even in their teen years, when they were struggling with things, they would ask their father to pray for them. We have time just for a special, concerted focus on us as a couple coming before God together with the Holy Word of God. And we just tell the kids, this is mom and dad's time with Jesus. We just have that uh, as a, a private time where we close our bedroom door and the kids know not to disturb us and we open up God's Word and we pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts as a couple and bless us and we read scripture together and we discuss it together and we apply it together we take time to wonder out loud about what God may be saying to us and that's a very rich time for us as a couple but then before we're finished with that time we ask each other how can I pray for you? And we ask each other both ways because we want to know how we can minister to each other in the deepest, most intimate way through prayer. Then we get on our knees together as a couple. And we love holding hands and, and, and we'll cry out to God for 
our Heavenly Father to bless each other. As your children get older, I'll comment when you eat together about something that you learned in your time with God today that helps them know that you had that time and that it meant something to you personally. You know, if we're going to pass the faith of Jesus from our hearts to our children, we must first make sure that we are going deeper with Jesus every single day. Your children will never go on a journey with Jesus that you are not on first. This is very humbling to me and my wife. Wow! You know, to think that, that our kids are following our lead as we go with Jesus, so they will go. If we really believe that the success of our families will depend upon our connection with Christ, if we really believe that our families don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, then we will make the Word of God a priority. And I'll tell you, it's hard, I know, to find that time to have that thoughtful hour of prayer and contemplation of the things of God. But if we're going to actually pull this off, if our children are going to see us growing in the Lord, see our faith in action, then we must make that a priority by getting to bed on time the night before so that we can be up early enough to have some kid-free time with Jesus. And of course, newborns don't allow that kid-free time, so we do our best during the various stages of life. But the question is, do our children see Christ in us? Are we growing in the Lord in a visible way? Just by living, the child, your children, will pick up your faith or lack of faith. They will pick up what you say, what you do, how you control your emotions, how you say things to them that will give them uh, a, a fairly good, accurate picture of your faith. So, if you never pick up your Bible, they're not going to think you, you know, uh, have a very strong faith. Um, if you're always hitting them over the head with, well, the Bible says this, um, they're not going to appreciate. Uh, they'll know you're a hypocrite because you certainly don't follow everything that Scripture says to do. Don't let your relationship with God be one of the best kept secrets in your family. Uh, talk about what's happening in your own life, decisions you have to make, difficult decisions at the office if you have teenagers. They need to know how faith lives. So my suggestion is you've got to make sure that you're an open book to your children in terms of your spirituality. Let it just shine through. If you're um, disappointed, be disappointed. Pray about it and let your children see how God comforts you, how God brings a, a Bible text to your, to your mind, how you found something that you underlined this morning that is just exactly what you needed, and share it with your children over breakfast, when you pick them up in the car. Let them know that miracles happen all the time. Making our faith clearly evident to our children cannot be done with words. It's got to be done with actions. Actions speak louder than words. That saying has been around for a long time, for good reason. There's another song, a song I love. It says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. So we can tell our children, yes, this is what we believe, but they've got to see it lived out. They've got to see mom and dad really putting efforts into denying their wishes to help the children in their pursuits or occupations or school. They've got to see mom and dad confessing their wrongs either to each other or to the children if they've wronged the children. But we have, we've got to live it at home. We can live it at church and that helps, but really if we fake it at church because we're not living it at home, it's not going to work. We've got to live it at home behind closed doors when nobody else is watching. That is what will make our faith clearly evident to the sponge minds of our children. The first thing that's important in building a positive, uh, godly character in your child is your influence. How are you acting? 
If you get upset over little things, guess what? Your children will get upset. When they make a mistake, when they've gone the wrong way, uh, do they see the love and forgiveness of Jesus pouring through us to them? I pray that they do. We show our love also when we forgive and forget something a child has done. We don't talk about it again. We don't keep bringing it up. I don't know if I can trust you because the other day you did. No. Forgive it and forget it. That's the way we show our love. I'll never forget at nursery school when I was a nursery school teacher. I had a little boy come to school one morning and, and he went to the table and he just banged the table and he went to the wall and he just banged the wall. And I thought that was strange behavior. So I asked mom, was anything happening at home that this, this is what her son was doing? And she started laughing. She said, oh, my husband last night could not get the refrigerator door opened. It was sticking and he just went like this on the refrigerator door. And that child was totally copying what dad's reaction was to the emotion of frustration and anger. And so your children will do what you do. So your influence is vitally important. It's just doing life with the idea that Jesus is my Lord, He is my King. And so I want to um, honor Him in everything, everything that I do. So sometimes that means if we are uh, watching something, uh, like, like we get a video, and we think it's going to be a wonderful video to watch as a family, and there's something inappropriate on it, it means that I need to be the kind of man, kind of a father, who goes up to the, the, um, that uh, TV screen and turns it off if it's inappropriate and just say to them, you know, this is something I think that uh, I would, would really make Jesus sad if I watched. It would just dishonor him. And so daddy's going to turn this off. Um, it means sometimes when we're listening to the radio in the car and, and it's beautiful music and then something comes on that we think, oh, I dishonor Jesus. I need to be the kind of, of daddy that in front of the children is willing to turn off the music uh, when it's something that's not so good. Um, the list goes on and on. Think of all the lifestyle choices of a, of a day. It means uh, honoring God with my stewardship of how I use my time, of what I eat, drink, uh, whatever I do. If you don't want them watching those television shows, you don't watch them. Um, if you don't want them spending hours on the internet, you don't spend hours on the internet. Um, if you don't want them slurping their soup, you don't slurp your soup, you know? So uh, influence is very important. Too many of us, as we grow up, have just become secure in doing whatever our job is, and we say, well, we make good money at it. Oh, we pay the bills. But the question is, are, do our children see us having the joy of living our God-given dream. What I mean is, do our children see us using our gifts and talents to the greatest degree to give God praise and honor? Our children are watching us to see how we live our lives. Are they seeing us live with passion in our lives? Or have we let that go and let your kids see that you are living in the center of God's will for you. This is something that will ignite in them a passion to also discover what their God-given dream is. Um, you're like a filter to their spiritual development. They will see God in you. I recently enjoyed a conversation with a 12-year-old and his mother. We were talking about the influences of media, and through the course of the conversation, his mother and I had a very good agreement that anything that Jesus wouldn't approve of us watching, that he wouldn't want to watch with us, we probably shouldn't be watching. The 12-year-old was listening in, and he jumped in and he said, well, mom, then you shouldn't be watching such and such a show, and he named a show that I had not heard of. But it was kind of an awkward moment, but we move on and think. Are we going to have a greater influence on our children by telling them not to watch things that Jesus wouldn't approve of, or by actually not watching the things that Jesus wouldn't approve of? And on a related note, it is such a sad fact 
that less than one in 10 American Christian families today are spending any time in prayer other than at mealtimes. We are simply not praying together. There's nothing that grieves the heart of God more than a prayerless home. If we are going to try to help our children see that walking with the Lord is a faith experience, a life experience, We've got to be bleeding and incorporating all of the spiritual elements into everyday life, into everything we do with our children. If religion is just compartmentalized over to certain set times and occasions and it's not a part of life, then, you know, we can't blame our children as they get older for drawing the conclusion that religion is just a mere formality and a, a cultural tendency. It's not something real. That's what they've seen, that's what they've experienced, and that's why they're leaving the church in such great number. So how can we bring prayer and spiritual things into the daily experience of our families? Without prayer, there isn't such a thing as spiritual parenting. We must have the influence of the Holy Spirit with us all the time. It's the Holy Spirit that influences our children brings God's thoughts to them. We can claim specific promises of God's. And then we know that we are always praying within God's will because these are promises from His Word. And literally, we can pray our children through their day. We can pray them through their day hour by hour. Never let your children leave your home without making a prayer hedge around them, a protective prayer hedge. I think it's neat as a family to join hands before you go out to the door, out the door, and pray that God will be with each one of you the whole day and pray specifically about whatever things are happening in your children's lives and in your own lives as you're making this protective hedge around your family before you leave. My father never started the car without praying that we would have a safe journey. Put the child's name in the verse. Let's try Psalms 91.11. Now that verse says, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And you want to pray today for your child's safety. So, how do you pray? For he will give his angels charge over Garrett today to keep him in all his ways. You've made that Bible promise personal by doing that. As a mother, I always prayed any time I had a little break in what I was doing or if I was doing something around the house that was not was simple and you know you can pray while you're making the beds. You can pray while you're doing the dishes. Uh, If you go to work, you can pray on your way to the restroom. You can pray when you're driving. You can pray with your husband or wife. You can pray with a dear friend, both of you praying for your children. I think it's nice to write prayers. In fact, I think it's nice to keep a prayer journal for each of your children. And there you write in your journal or keep your journal on your cell phone or your computer or a small little notebook in which you write prayers and that's so encouraging because then you leave back ah that one's been answered yes that one's been answered yes that one's been answered yes and it's so encouraging to see how God has worked with your child tell your children you're praying for them they need to know that you're praying for them So pray with your children. Uh, Pray over little things. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed over my lost keys. And you know what? I think I found every single lost key. And um, the children know when you are real, when you are living this faith, rather than thinking, well, a good Christian goes to church. So you've got to get there on time and you jolly well better be happy, but it's miserable getting, they they understand that just going to church has very little to do with your personal walk with God. Pray with your children. 
pray about anything and everything that happens in your family. That's a way of showing your spiritual experience. I remember when our oldest was in her, I would say about 11, we had gold shag carpet. And you know those watch bands that have a little gold um, to hold the watch band together? It's like a pen. She, it was gold, and she dropped it in the gold shag. And that's like finding a needle in a haystack. And she came to me and asked me to pray with her so she could find this gold pen. So we knelt and prayed, and the Lord showed her exactly where to go in that gold carpet and shag and find that gold pen. And so the Lord kept honoring those, and, um, and we know it was just because He wanted our children to understand the power of prayer. And I always uh, love the memory the, of my parents saying at the end of worship, okay, let's kneel together. We kneel together as a family. We make a little circle, and that's a sacred circle. And we would pray that the God of heaven would bless us and keep us. And to this day, when I call my family to worship, and we read God's word, we sing songs, we pray together, I also gather my family in a little circle, just like my mother and father did for me. And we join hands, making our own little sacred circle, and we ask God to put his hand over us and bless us. Uh, my children got so good at praying that they prayed for everything. I remember when they were two and three, we went to a Christian bookstore to buy some things, and it was pouring down rain. My husband and I were in the front seat trying to decide what are we going to do to get into this building. While we're discussing it, our girls are in the back seat praying, and we heard them ask Jesus to stop the rain. And we thought, should we stop them? What should we do? And we just decided, well, we'll wait to see what God did. And sure enough, the rain stopped. And we looked at each other like, oh my, that's amazing. Went into the store. The minute we walked in, it poured down rain again. And we did all our shopping. And on the way out, it was pouring down rain. They stopped. They prayed again. The rain stopped. And we got in our car. And we knew that God was then trying to teach our children that prayer was important. He honored everything that our children prayed for. Recently, my wife and I were having a difficult time with our second son, Silas. He's a baby, and nap time is never fun for children, but he was having a particularly difficult time at this particular nap. And feeling a bit convicted myself that I had not been putting the baby to sleep, which I had done for his older brother when he was a baby, I said, well, let me go in there and, and try it. And so I rocked him. I said, you know, I used to do this to my first son, is rock him to sleep sometimes. And so I, I, I got the child, and. I, you know, I, I figured this would be just the same as it was before, right? Oh no, the screaming and the flailing and the arching of the back and the, the child was very, very unhappy. And after some far too casual prayers, I confess, I finally went to the Lord with all sincerity and complete dependence saying, Lord, I know that we have not trained this child perfectly. We have made mistakes and we have done things perhaps that we are not even aware of. And I confess this before you and I ask you, Father, please show us the error of our ways, correct our parenting, and guide us along your paths. And now please do for this child what I cannot do for him. And you know what? The moment I said amen, literally within a second, the child went completely limp. Silas, the little baby in my hands, his eyes fell and he was asleep within a second and a half. It was an incredible, miraculous moment that testifies to the importance of prayer, that God will answer prayers, sometimes not in the timing that we expect, but in this occasion, he wanted to show me that he is a father to this child, and that if we confess and go humbly before God, he will answer our prayers. We've begun keeping a prayer journal with our older son, Levi. Many times something has gone missing in the house. And so we ask the Lord to help us find it. And it shows up and we write it down and we have a thank you prayer together as a family. Even most recently, the, the second child, Silas, he's been starting solid foods. And that takes some adjusting in his digestive system. And his tummy was not happy. And we were all realizing this. It was not a, not a, a happy day. So we prayed and we said, Lord, we know that you want the baby to be happy. And we just pray that you would complete that digestive process and help the baby to feel better. And guess what? Right after he woke up from his nap, 
We all as a family witness the evidence of a successful digestive process and again had that moment of thanking the Lord. As our children see God answering prayer through their childhood, they will see that the Lord is interested even in the most mundane and normal things of life like bathroom things. Our God is involved spiritually in our lives from start to finish. We even have opportunities to bring God into their work. And we call it God talk. And I like to take every opportunity to do God talk. And so when they're washing dishes, we talk about God. I would leave some, purposely leave some plates that had food on it that had caked on for a couple hours, and then some that were freshly dirty. And then we'd put those in and show them how easy it was to clean up a plate when it's fresh. But when you let the food cake on there is so hard to clean and that's what sin does in the life when God shows you something in your heart if you get rid of it right away it's very easy to get rid of it but if it sits there for a while it's a lot harder so we want to take care of sin immediately when God tells you something you want to repent right away and get rid of it that's an opportunity to do God talk when we actually would go outside and work in the garden the same way I don't know if you've ever stepped on skunk weed but it stinks really bad but when you step on basil, it smells really, really sweet. So we talked about the difference. When you step on it, I had the children step on it and tell me what it smelled like. And I said, what do you think Jesus wants? When somebody steps on you, do you think he wants you to smell like skunkweed? Or do you think he wants you to smell like sweet basil? And of course, they said sweet basil. So I said, well, I'm going to help you then. Every time I see that you're not smelling like sweet basil, I'm going to work with your heart so we know how you can always shine that way for Jesus and smell sweet. So you have a lot of opportunities to talk about spiritual things with your children if you just look for those times. If you want to have spiritual conversations with your children, then check out Jesus' example that we find in the gospel story. We learn from Jesus that early in the morning he would get up while it was even still dark and he would spend time with his heavenly father. Because this was a part of his DNA to spend time in the word of God and with his heavenly father, spiritual uh, conversations just happened through the day because they flowed out of his heart. Our conversations are the overflow of our experience. And so if you want spiritual conversations with your kids, go deep with Jesus. Spend time with him so he's on your thoughts all the time. It's fun at the breakfast table to talk to my children about what Jesus has shown me in the written word of God as well as in the great outdoors that he created because this is part of my day. If I had to figure out, hmm, how am I going to have a spiritual conversation? and make it real formal. I probably wouldn't know how to do it. Um, it just needs to be the overflow of what I'm doing. Your kids will be curious to know your, about your interaction with your Heavenly Father. Is this very real to you? They'll wonder, uh, how do you pray? How do you hear God's voice? How do you open up God's Word and know who He is? These are special spiritual conversations. Spiritual conversations come up as we listen to them very keenly with all our hearts, we listen to them and, and want to understand what's going on with them. Uh, we are looking for ways to tie in their experience with something encouraging or helpful from the written Word of God or from our own experience with Jesus ourselves. Now what I'm just sharing right now, having an opportunity to always talk with your child, is actually a biblical principle and Every time I read the Bible when I was working with my children, I would find those biblical principles and then I would apply them. This is in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. For you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So as you can see, God wants us to constantly be telling our children about him so that our children understand their spiritual walk and how to walk with Jesus. I think one of the ways parents can make their faith clearly evident to their children 
is by involving the children in their spiritual life and their conversations in just simple ways. So that's explaining to a child why you're doing something when your faith is inspiring you, how your faith helps you to think about the things that happen in your everyday life, how your faith inspires you to do something kind for another person or inspires you to do something in the role you take in your local church. And I think when children hear the thinking that goes behind the choices that you're making and why and how your faith inspires that, I think that helps the children to see how everything you do is founded on your faith in a really simple way. You need to be a good information giver, not a lecturer uh, that's telling them all the things they have done wrong, not someone who's constantly critiquing them, but someone who's open to giving them the information they need to make decisions. I believe that you should pre-teach children. Before pornography is an issue, talk to them about how the devil wants to um, cause them to look at certain things that makes them do things that they are not ready to do, they're not mature enough, that should be saved for marriage. And um, talk to them about the kind of boyfriend that you hope that they will choose some, someday. Now notice your daddy, how he played with you in the park. I want you to choose a man who will uh, enjoy playing with the children, who will be a good role model for children. Start early pre-teaching with information, the important things you want for your child. It's a sad fact that less than one in ten Christian families in America today open the Word of God to study and examine God's will for them during a given week. Less than one in ten Christian families are opening the Word of God as a family. But the successful Christian parents raise their children to be spiritually strong young adults by raising them on the food, the bread of life, the Word of God. How can we do the same? Studying the Bible with our children is a matter of prioritizing time. In our family, we, we picked this up from somebody else. In fact, it's, even, it's in the scriptures there. In scriptures, they had morning and evening sacrifice back there in the Old Testament. We have morning and evening worship. And that's where we open the scriptures together as a family and we study these things through. If you do that day after day after day, year after year, by the time they leave home, you spend thousands of hours in the scriptures together. And it's a, it's a tremendous bond to each other. It's a, you're gaining a knowledge of the scriptures and it's the best thing we can give our kids before they leave home. You know, this makes me think about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, everywhere he went, would build an altar to the Lord and he'd call his family together and, and uh, they would worship. They would worship as a family. And you can go through the book of Genesis and see this again and again. And Abraham was passionate about calling his family to worship. You know, it's so easy to say, I'm too busy to have family worship. And I would just urge any family, young or old, to take the time daily to simply call the family together and to open up the Word of God. And after you've uh, prayed together, uh, read a passage together and discuss it together and apply it to your lives. Uh, this does not have to take a long time. In fact, uh, I, I often tell my friends and, and colleagues, I would rather have a three or four or five minute worship that connects with the children than to have a half an hour worship where they're crying or exasperated with each other. The point is, call your family together. Also, we want to set up Bible study, so we want our children to understand how to study the Word, and we use that during our family worship time. In the morning, we had very little time because my husband worked outside the home, so whatever the girls would study in their own personal devotions, that's what we talked about in morning worship. We'd have prayer, and then they would share what God was teaching them. That was a real blessing to us because we could see how God was working on them, the tr things that they struggled with that we didn't realize, and how God was teaching them. Well, we also model pursuing God with all our hearts when we call the family together for family worship. 
You know, our children have watched over the years as April and, and I, after a, a busy day, when the children know we're tired, maybe we're worn out, they watch us intently. And they watch to see what our attitude is. Is family worship still a high priority when daddy and mommy are tired? And sometimes I've had to literally go into uh, the room, one of the side rooms, or go outside and say, God, I need your help right now. If I'm going to ever lead my family in worship tonight, I need extra help from heaven so that I can lead my family. When we're trying to excite our children about the Bible, what we need to think about is what do they like the most? What, what inspires our children? What do they get excited about? What are their gifts, their strengths, their interests? And we need to study our children, find out what that looks like. And then we need to match whatever we're going to study in the Bible, whatever we're going to do to serve others, to the gifts, the needs, the interests, the strengths of our children, so that they, they can feel really excited about what we're doing for them. You know, if we have children who um, are really active and like to experience things with their whole body, to touch, to taste, to move, and we try to read them stories about the Bible, it's not going to connect with them. They need to be active. They need to be moving pieces around on a table or acting something out or doing something very specific or smelling or hearing something that helps them to understand the story. So I think we need to focus on what it is our children really need, how they learn the best, what delights them, and to focus our thinking and what we do with our children spiritually around the things that are matched to them. God does that for us. He knows each one of us. He's made us all different. And in the sanctuary services and the worship through the Bible, there are all sorts of different ways that people could learn verbally, visually, and by touching and smelling and seeing things and being involved in action. Because he knew we're all different. And he treats us all differently. So the more we understand about our children's way of learning best, our children's um, activities that excite them and energize them and delight them, and then we will know how to guide them into spiritual matters and how to find the things that will really excite them for God. Um, I think we also need to think about Sabbath and how we make Sabbath a delight for our children. Because I think far too often we have just done Sabbath without thinking, what does it mean for Sabbath to be a delight? And what is delightful for me is different than what's delightful for my son or my husband or my daughter. And so we need to think about what delights them and what can we do on Sabbath that will bring each person delight, whether it's the food we serve, the places we go to, the things that we do, how we share worship together. What will delight each of you? And then your Sabbath will become much more joyful rather than um, a burden. So we need to think about what delight means and how we can put that into action with each person in our family. Interestingly, one of the characteristics of the successful Christian parents who raised spiritually strong young adults is that their kids were raised in orderly homes. Now that's tough for me because I'm not naturally an orderly person, but I've realized that this is a spiritual mandate. The Bible says that everything should be done decently and in order. How can we pull this off? Um, I think what we've learned over the years with three children is keep it simple, really simple. Do you really need that many books, that many toys, that many clothes, this much stuff? I think the less stuff there is in a home, the easier it is to keep it all under control and manage. The easier it is for, their ch for your children to manage. And we used to put loads of toys up in the attic and out the way and just have a few toys in their room. And they could circulate them and choose a few at a time. So maybe they only had 10 in their room at a time. And when they got bored with one, they could go and swap it for another. And that way it was much easier for them to manage the stuff in their room. Also, if everything has a clear place and you have pictures and labels for children to match things up to and make putting away a game and fun, that makes it easier for children to manage as well. So keep it simple, break it down, and um, then you'll all find it much more easy to, to manage the amount of stuff that most homes, homes can accumulate. An orderly home doesn't just happen. In fact, the opposite is true, and a disorderly home will just naturally occur unless we are very intentional about keeping the place tidy. 
And mums, unfortunately, I have to tell you, the buck does stop with you. It is up to us to see to it that our homes are an orderly place. Not that we have to do everything, but that we have to manage it. So everything needs to have a place. And then it doesn't just need to have a place, you need to see to it that it gets put there. And if the children don't put it there, or your husband doesn't put it there, then encourage them where it needs to go. And you know, the easiest way to do that is just simply not to have too much stuff. We know a lot of people who have a lot of stuff. We used to have a lot more stuff than we do now, but it's good to get rid of it. You know, we have a philosophy in our family. If Say it in, together. If in, in doubt, doubt throw, throw it, it out. out. Or throw chuck it out. Or chuck it out, yeah. <laughs> get rid of it. Take it to the thrift store. Somebody else will use it and it will be a huge blessing to you in your home. So an orderly home, you know, we all prefer an orderly home, don't we? Well, an orderly home will lead uh, over a period of time to more orderly thoughts. And that's more of a God thing. So keep the place tidy. It takes effort. If you've got young children, you know how difficult it is to keep that marriage strong. In fact, some research has shown that dissatisfaction in marriage is at the highest during the baby and toddler years. It is hard to keep that bond of unity, but how can we strengthen our connection with our spouse? And does it even matter with child rearing? It's very interesting to me that children often uh, see a, a direct correlation between the way mommy and daddy love each other and the way that they sense that God loves them. They really understand a lot about God's love by seeing the way we love each other as husbands and wives. So that they need to catch us uh, forgiving each other and holding each other close afterwards and, and apologizing to each other and saying, you know, honey, I've, I'm sorry that I've I've been irritated with you. I'm sorry that I've been impatient with you. And this is a, a way of modeling to our children that shows them what love is like. Keeping our marriage vibrant whilst we're in the midst of raising our children can be a problem because what happens is we, the mother particularly gets involved in the children, the dad gets involved in his career, and we, we forget that the marriage came first. We, we were married, most of us, before we had our children. So that relationship was there and it needs to be fostered even through the busy time of raising children. How we have done that is we have taken time to just get away sometimes, leave the children with the grandparents or somebody we really, 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 really trust, not just anybody, and then we go off and we have a beautiful time together. It strengthens our marriage. And the advantage of having a strong marriage is then we come back and we manage the children as a united front. And that goes way better because when we're divided, the children figure it out and they start working one against the other. That's right. And moms, you know, it's harder for us, I think, to leave the children and go, particularly when they're younger. And I know for years you would encourage that we would go someplace, just the two of us. And I was, what about the children? And I, I how old were the children? I think they were like eight and 10 or yeah. 10 and 12 when we finally did do that. And of course, you know, what did I do? I felt guilty, or at least I was tempted with those thoughts. And for the first two days, we just, I mean, we, we were talking going for a week. That's what we did anyways. And for the first two days, all we did was talk about the children. And then after that, we started to just be an us, be the two of us. And we've done it a couple of times. The second time, we didn't really talk about the children. Mm -hmm. We just were part, part of us now. And I can honestly say that even though it took me a while to kind of get on board with the thought, when we went away, just the two of us, our marriage has never been the same since. It's definitely the marriage and the children come underneath of that. And a strong marriage leads to great parenting. It does, it does. It makes a huge difference. So you have to make sure that those who care for your children when you're not there have the same kind of motivation spiritually that you do, that have can be a picture of God to, the, to your children, that you want your children to have. So how do you grow your marriage when you've got kids running all over the house? How do you keep close to your mate when kids are tugging at your sleeves and asking for help and wanting to be with mommy or and they want to, to have dad's help? Number one, take time to talk together. It's one of the simplest things not to do when you have kids running around the house and running around you and needing you all the time. You need time to talk. I remember when our kids were just little 
April and I would sometimes stare at each other and say, when are we ever going to have a chance just to talk together without somebody needing something? And then we came across this simple plan. We both loved to walk, and so we would put the kid, or eventually kids, into the stroller, and we'd push them ahead of us, and as we pushed them ahead of us and walked along the way, the kids would be watching the cars go by, or sometimes when we lived out in the country, they'd watch the cows <laughs> as we went by, and they were caught up with nature around them, or, or the traffic around them, and that was our special time to talk. And we consider that holy time, time as a couple, just to really have good communication together. I work as a marriage and family therapist, and one of the things that's coming out of the research now is showing us that if, if you as a couple can connect closely 10 minutes a day, 10 separate minutes a day, in a really significant way, and that is a minimum, then that will really help to keep the relationship going and sparked and fueled. And it, and it might just mean you um, make a connection with a text, an email, a phone call, a hug, um, the things don't have to be very long. A kiss, sharing a piece of fruit, and pouring a drink for each other. Very simple things. But the more you do these very small, simple things for each other, the more there is an experience of love between you and in the home. And the thoughtfulness you put into doing something for the other person and to do something um, in a small moment that will make the other person happy will really... Um, be an investment in your relationship and your children will notice it too what they will learn is the small things count that they are part of building a healthy strong relationship it's not all about going out for dinner once a week or going out for weekends to a lovely hotel it's often the love and care you show in the everyday life even when things are busy that makes the biggest difference to feeling really loved and cared for. And there are things that we can do, even when we're really busy, make a list of all the things you can do to show love to your partner in a minute or five minutes or ten minutes, so that when you do have a moment, you can go to the list and you know exactly what to do that will help you share love right then. And let your children see you doing those things and see that that means how much you love each other. We need to take time for romance. You know, uh, gone are the days once you have kids of having an easy way to run off and have a date. You know, go to a place to eat out or, or whatever you like to do when you are just dating or courting each other before that wedding day. But once you have children, you have to think outside the box of how you're going to still have those, those special fun times together. Uh, you know, when we celebrate the, the love that we have for each other as a couple, they remember when the children were little that they gathered them and told them, Tonight is mommy and daddy's special, special dinner together. And they're going to light candles and they're going to celebrate the, the love that Jesus has given them for each other. And so help us decorate. And so they got their kids to help them decorate a little table in the middle of their living room. And they put a little tablecloth on it and plates just for mommy and daddy. And then across the room, they made a, a smaller table just for the kids so that they could have their little date together, brother and sister together. And they also had special plates for them. And you know, that night, uh, that couple, my friends, uh, they celebrated a very special day for them in their marriage, and their kids had fun celebrating too. Is it the same as going off just together? No, uh, it's not the same. But you know, if you ask God to bless you in those, those special celebrations, He will. Don't give up on having romance in your marriage just because you have kids around. Take time for each other. There has never been a perfect human parent. Everybody watching this, including myself, has at times felt like a failure. And what do we do with that feeling? And where do we go from here? What if we find ourselves making the same mistakes our parents made? It is inevitable. We are going to default in our parenting to the way we were parented. It's just because we had 20 years of it. It's ingrained in us. And so if we haven't replaced 
that with a new knowledge base, we're just going to default back to it. So my encouragement is to get a new knowledge base. In other words, fill your mind with a new way of parenting that will kick in rather than just default into how you were parented. And don't beat yourself up over it when you do find words coming out of your mouth that you've heard coming to your ears when you were a little person and you said, I'll never do that. Because as Paul said, we, we do tend to default to that. What we need to do when that happens is we go to our knees and ask the Lord to help us. And then we pick right up and move right on rather than wallowing, oh no, I'm doing it and I never should have done it and all the rest of it. So don't beat yourself up when it happens. It's so easy to make the same mistakes our parents made. Um, especially when we're under pressure and it's so easy to fall back into the default mode. I think for me, when I felt like that was happening, I stopped, took myself aside and refocused on God's parenting and refocused on how he parents me, how much he loves me. I make a real study of that because when I feel a bit of, as a, at a bit of a loss as a human parent, for whatever reason, God has been the perfect parent and there is always something there when I go back and ask him and look at his parenting and how he has parented me that inspires me to do what's right, to do what's the most loving thing for my child. How I study the Bible to really help me in my parenting is actually to look at the Bible as a parenting book and look at God as the father and us as his children. We know that, but we don't tend to think about, you know, what happened in back there in Genesis and Exodus and through the Old Testament. We don't tend to view that as parenting material. But if you, if you go back, put on different glasses, take a look at it for the fact that God was parenting Adam and Eve. Look at how he did it. God was parenting Abraham and Noah and all these different great men of the Bible. I mean, because we call God our father and we say we're children of God. So there's a parental child relationship. And the, like you say, the Old Testament is full of parenting. Right, there's stuff. just so many amazing principles of seeing how God, the thing that really comes across to me more than anything else, that God was so incredibly long suffering. Yes, he was a very just God and he would give out consequences for you know the sins of his people but he was a very very merciful God very merciful another uh, tool that we have used that helped us understand the Bible is uh, an old old parenting book called child guidance it's we have read it or oh, probably three or four times mm -hmm. together and discussed its principles and looked up its text is a fantastic practical help to helping us understand how to parent our children all parents make mistakes. The important thing is that you recognize the mistakes that you make and are willing to say, I'm sorry, willing to change. Uh, we have to recognize that that is part of life. So what I say is keep learning. Uh, my mom said to me many times as I started working with, with young parents, oh, she said, Kay, if, if I would have only known those things when I was parenting my, your, you, know, you and your brother and sisters, uh, it would have made such a difference. Well, you can choose to change, but let me tell you, you will not change if you don't feel good about yourself. If you don't feel like you are capable, if you feel like you've been put down all your life, if you feel like you can't do anything right, if you feel you're a terrible parent, let me tell you, it won't be easy for you to change. But the more you feel like, I can do it, God is in this thing with me. These are really his kids that I'm, I'm raising for eternity. And when you have that kind of an attitude, then when something new comes along, you'll say, oh, I could try that. Well, that's interesting. I've never done it that way before. You don't have to stick in the rut of bad parenting. You can choose to get out of it. Try something new.